activity. We're not doing a lot. We're not, we're not being a good campus citizen. We're not attending the right forums on campus. There's a million things that you need to do. But you need to pick three, four, or five that are the most important. And that's where I'm headed with this thing. But my high school principal taught me a great lesson. He was a great guy. But he was really good at the $5 an hour job. And nobody was doing the $25 an hour job. And that's really hit home with me 37 years later. And so I typically try to get our staff to focus, and I try to focus. Because there's lots of stuff where you can get immediate gratification that I get attracted to. But I really work hard to stay on the things that really matter. You figure out my, my role in the organization is X. I'm getting compensated for that at some point, at some level. I better be delivering at that level. And so and it's very easy to kind of get yourself uh, again, distracted and, and finding yourself in a, in a position where you're defocused. So focus is a very, very big part of, uh, of being a sport administrator, of being an executive, being a leader, okay? Um, so for me, over the years, I've created this thing I call three and five. And there are challenges, which I have three that I'm going to share with you. And again, my prism's intercollegiate athletics, but there's some applicability to to other interests in the room, I would hope and I, I, and I would think. And the other, the, on the other side of the ledger, there's five opportunities. Three challenges, five opportunities. And I can tell you, when I lay in bed at night and, I'm, and I can't sleep, it's typically because one of those challenges or one of those opportunities. Because everything else, I've kind of got delegated. And because I can't do all the other stuff. I'd love to, love to go to practice. I'd love to go to every practice. But I, that's not what I'm getting paid to do. I need to get to an occasional practice, but I can't get to every practice. I can't do lots of stuff I'd like to do. But there's three things that I better lay in bed and worry about every night, and then there are five things I better pay a whole lot of attention to if we're going to be a good intercollegiate athletics program. And it's just that simple. The challenges. Balance, compliance, and economics. Again, in my little world, in my silo, where I live, you have to somehow maintain the appropriate balance between academics and athletics if you're going to have, if you're going to have an intercollegiate athletics program that works. By the way, the kids that are in your, at Duke, let's just say, let me, let me go with Duke. Duke is 26 sports, 620 student athletes, pretty competitive academic environment, but those kids have got to plug into that curriculum and compete against other general population Duke students, and they've got to compete pretty successfully. To have, a, to have an environment, maintain an environment where kids can do both is really important. Because by the way, that's what you sold them when you recruited them. When they, when they came on their official visits, when you were in their homes, you said, throw in with us, come to Duke, and you're gonna have a life-changing experience, or come to Ohio, it really doesn't matter. But you better deliver in fact, you better over-deliver what you promise, because we're in the referral business. And you better, you better maintain that appropriate balance where it all works. And there are places where if you get, you, there are places, and, and we all know this, I mean, where you can minor in academics and major in athletics. I mean, we know that. That's part of my little industry, my subsector. Um, but if you sold double majoring, where a kid can come to a place and get a world-class education, that's what you sold, and you're going to, and at the same time, that young person is going to have a chance to win championships in my setting, ACC or national championships. You better deliver that. You better deliver what you sold. Yeah, absolutely better. So balance and maintaining the appropriate balance where kids can do both is really important. I don't want to drone on too far, too much on the balance issue, but paying attention to the to the athletic side is just as important as to the academic side. I've, had, I've been at Duke now just uh, 11 months, just 11 months. I've had so many one-on-one -on -one conversations and with some larger grouping of, of faculty members, but lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with faculty members where they want me to say, it, the kids that make the Duke decision come here because of the academics and, and athletics is secondary. And I, I tell them all the time, I can't Pinocchio you. I can't do that because kids aren't making that decision, by the way. You're fooling yourself. They're coming to Duke or they're coming to Ohio because they're coming for both. They're coming for the package. And, um, and they want to, and I, the expression I've coined as of late, they want a double major. They want a double major. And so, so you better deliver what it is you sell, what you market. And so creating the right relationship between academics and athletics, for me, is really big. And that's the most significant challenge because that can get out of kilter pretty quickly. 
The second challenge is compliance. I can remember being at Loris College, being announced as the athletics director at Loris College in 1982. I was 32 years old. And I can remember thinking, and I was a track and recovering track and field coach. I was just coming out of track and field and had terrible coaching withdrawal, making this big decision. And I can remember thinking, oh my God, now I better know all these rules and regs that apply to all these programs. Are you kidding me? All I had to worry about was track and field before. And I can remember taking that NCA manual in 1982 home on like the first weekend and reading the damn thing. And almost feeling like it was like the size of the Dubuque, Iowa phone book. I mean, I almost felt like I understood it and I could remember it. And I can tell you now, and how many people in here have got a compliance background? Anybody? One? Today, it's like multiple New York City phone books, <laughs> and it's in, in terps, and, and I can't remember what generation we're in. Because uh, I can remember when the, the rule was X, and then five years later, it went to X minus three, and then 10 years later, it went to Y plus one. I just can't remember what generation we're in. I know, I, I know I've heard that rule before, but I don't know what generation, and they all cycle back. And what happens is, in my little profession, which is, probably pretty typical of lots of professions, and a lot of you are interested in college athletics, um, I, I would just tell you that the proliferation of rules is not because of the NCAA. I mean, the pundits, they just don't get it. That's, that's the silliest thing in the world. We hire that group to be a Gestapo group and put them in, in Indianapolis. The member institutions hire the people at, at the NCAA. We create the rules, the members do. We look for an opportunity to gain an advantage over one another, and we create these crazy rules and we're all looking for an advantage, and the rules just continue to proliferate, and that's what's happened. And so when I lay in bed at night, I can't tell you what, what happened at 2 a.m. the night before. I can't tell you who talked to who. All the constituency groups, 620 student athletes, 110,000 alums, uh, gosh, another two or three million people that, that kind of at Notre Dame thought they were Subway alums. Uh, people are full of, yeah, people are full of what they think is, is um, you know, well-intended interest, but there's so many opportunities to have to find yourself out of the fairway. So many opportunities. And compliance, you know what, it, it, when you think in terms of compliance, you get, uh, yeah, I, I use this with, the, we, I spoke to our board of trustees on Saturday morning and I was telling them it takes, we, we've got about a hundred year history of the, the, the brand called Duke. I mean, Duke isn't that old, by the way. Duke is, in fact, it's less than that. It's, it's about an 88 year old school. Uh, but I can tell you it's taken 88 years to build this brand and to take about three seconds to lose it. And we almost lost it with an incident a few short years ago. It's, it's an amazing thing, this thing called compliance. And so when I lay in bed at night, boy, I'm thinking about compliance. Did I think about that? Did I do this as our staff? And I can remember in 1982, there wasn't anybody in the NCA with a title that had compliance in their title. We were over. We didn't have anybody on any of our staffs. And now, I, at Duke, we have five full-time people, and there are places with seven, eight, and nine. You know, and, and we have several attorneys in our group, but it's grown to that proportion. And my sense is, we're gonna still look for ways to gain an advantage over one another, and it's gonna continue to proliferate. This compliance thing is, is, is uh, it, 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 it does keep you up at night. I have a great friend who ran Coca-Cola for 35 years. His name is Don Keogh. I don't know if anybody in the room recognizes that name, but he was a, he was a you know a Fortune 500 icon guy, and uh, he had great expressions, you know, uh, great quips, and he would put his arm around me and he'd say, "How are we doing in compliance?" This is when I was at Notre Dame. I said, "Mr. Keogh, I think we're doing good," and he'd just say, "I got you know two words for you: stay nervous." And uh, that's what compliance is: stay nervous. Third challenge: economics. I can tell you. Right now, everybody's challenged from an economic standpoint. We know that. Uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago, Miles Brand had a town hall meeting in South Bend, and he came in, and the NCA had just done an exhaustive study, and they collected all the financial data across the member institutions, the 120 in, in 1A. And uh, he came in, and for the first time, he publicly indicated that their empirical data with good cost accounting measures indicated that out of the 120 institutions, there were only six that cash flowed. Six. So that means 114 institutions were not cash flowing, were being subsidized with some form of gimmetry financing. And I can tell you as we head to the next iteration, my fear is that's only going to get worse. Uh, particularly, that's way before this downturn. Uh, but institutions are heavily subsidizing in intercollegiate athletics. 